So the title is Globalization, Hybrid Worlds and Emerging Missional Frontiers by uh, Professor Calvin Chong. So Dr. Calvin Chong is Associate Professor of Practical Ministries at the Singapore Bible College. His teaching and research interests include church engagement with culture, urban missions, and diaspora missions. Dr. Chong also serves on the board of the Migrant NGO, Health Serve, and the Evangelical Fellowship of Singapore. Please welcome Dr. Calvin Chong. I got the final session. I think we are kind of tired. May the Lord give us strength. Uh, so the title is uh, Globalization, uh, Hybrid Worlds, and Emerging Missional Frontiers. Uh, when Juliet invited me to, to share this, uh, conference, uh, this consultation, uh, she actually offered me a different topic. And you know, for some reason, when I looked at the topic of globalization, I said, you know, I, that's something that really interests me. And I've done some teaching in the area. And after she said yes and sent me the alternative uh, letter, invitation letter, I said, what have I done? I've just committed suicide because it's such a big topic. And it truly is a very big topic. So uh, I'm really thankful to the Lord for, the, for His grace and uh, for helping me to scope it so that it hopefully becomes a bit more manageable and also meaningful uh, for us. Um, I want to give us a little road map of the session that I'm going to be doing. Uh, so first of all, uh, we are going to look at if this moves. What I want to do is to give us a little road map of the session. Uh, first of all, um, there are four, basically three, I think it's three sessions, uh, three parts to this paper. Um, first of all, I want to introduce the idea of movement and mixing in a globally connected world. Secondly, what I want to do is to talk, uh, and this is really the heart of my paper, the uh, active creation of uh, hybrid worlds. The third part is the evolving frontiers of hybridity and the relevance to uh, the diaspora mission. So that's kind of like the conclusion. Uh, so it's really three parts. And then obviously the final part is the question and answer. So first of all, let's look at the introduction to movement and mixing in a globally connected world. Uh, in my paper, what I do is I introduce to us uh, a primer to globalization by uh, Ericsson. Uh, the key concepts is a really thin book. But uh, he does talk in that book about the eight key concepts that characterize globalization. Uh, and you'll see it's, it's over there. But for the purposes of this paper, what I want to do is I want to focus on movement and mixing. Now, you will see in the slides, I have uh, yellowed out the page numbers in your uh, booklet so that you can track with me. There's going to be parts when I'm just going to be talking through using the slides. There are also going to be parts when I'm going to be reading from the text. So at that point of time, the yellow bits will help you uh, to tell you where you are. So on movement, I'm reading page 57, uh, 56, para uh, 2. Uh, movement is a concept in globalization studies which is both pivotal as well as familiar in the literature, also known as circulation by Ting. The idea is strongly featured in Ritz's definition of globalization, particularly in the tension and the emphasis that he gives to the phenomenon of liquidity and flow. So if you look at Ritz's book, which is Globalization, the Essentials, he's a Brit, um, and he defines globalization as a transplanetary process or set of processes involving increasing liquidity and growing and the growing multi-directional flows of people, objects, places, and information, as well as the structures they encounter and create that are barriers to or expedite those flows. Now, that definition in itself is really worth thinking through. Uh, it's not just the flows of these four elements, but it's also the barriers, the structures that they encounter. That's also very important. Your, um, visas and all that stuff. Now, it is clear that if one wanted to use a single term to think about globalization today, liquidity as well as the closely related idea of flows would be at or near the top of the list. Now, this is from Ritzer. Now, let me just try to capture what I've just said graphically. So, if you are here in the Northern Hemisphere, 
uh, in the world of connectivity, liquidity and flows, this is really what ha what's happens. Okay, you have people flows, you have object flows, you have places flows, and you have information flows. I think by places, it doesn't mean that the places actually come to you, but you know, your exposure to places probably through media, etc. And if you're in the southern hemisphere, likewise, these things do happen. Now, so Ritzer, however, was not the first person to talk about this idea. Way back in 1990s, uh, we had uh, an Indian um, sociologist who's based in New York, um, uh, Arjun Apadurai, who already proposed describing and analyzing global flows within the global cultural economy through the lens of five scapes. And for him, uh, there was ethnoscape, there was, and that's you know the people diaspora movement. But it's much more than just people movements, and that's really part of what I'm trying to you know bring across in this paper. Uh, it's worlds that are also being changing. Uh, that are also being changed. It's not just the people that are moving. Finance, technology, media scape, and this is idioscape. Now, this remember this is back in the 90s. That uh, and this he probably wrote this even before the internet uh, became popular. Now on the topic of mixing, so we just talked about movement, um, on the top of page 57. Uh, the concept of mixing in globalization studies has been studied, scrutinized, and debated at great length. Mixing or hybridity. Um, is inevitable in a world of liquidity and flows and can take on material or non-material expression. It is evidenced in objects and things, and individuals and identities, communities and populations, music and media, text and religions and, and uh, languages, religions and festivals, arts and architecture, fitness and sports. You can take any one of those and you can you know, have a, a lot of fun time just talking about hybridity uh, with respect to those elements. Yet, these mixes happen under a variety of situations. As Burke notes, these situations um, can involve equals or unequals. So I'm reading that paragraph all, I mean, that section all the way until the end of that section. Okay, and this is important. As Burke, um, sorry, where am I? Um, as Burke notes, these situations can involve equals or unequals, uh, depend on the presence of weak or strong tra traditions of appropriation, occur at urban metropolises or at border frontiers, and transpire within or across social classes. So uh, I give you the reference from Burke over there. Given the wide range of situations under which hybridity is wrought, it would not be surprising that taxonomies, descriptions, or responses, and outcomes of mixes are as varied as they are. And it's described in the books that I do want to recommend, like Gary. Uh, these are ex extremely useful because they, they present to us models of hybridity, which uh, I haven't heard so far. Uh, in this conference, uh, in this consultation. However, that's not my paper. <laughs> so, but I leave those references that you'll find at the, in the bibliography. Cacolini defines the term hybridization as social cultural processes in which discrete structures and practices previously existing in separate forms are combined to generate new structures, objects, and practices. Given that hybrid structures, objects, and practices are increasingly observed and uh, experienced in global cities and urban centers, now I'm not saying it doesn't happen elsewhere, but particularly in uh, global cities and urban centers, there is need to give attention to frontiers where hybridizing is active and flourishing. At these frontiers, life is being reordered and situations birthed which invite missional as well as pastoral responses. It is to these active, reordered frontiers that we will turn our attention to in the next section. So this is what I'm going to be looking at, the active creation of um, hybrid worlds. Now, in the paper, the next line, you, you see me making a statement, which is that hybridity is pervasive and it's it's been observed to be the new normal in many places, okay? Uh, it is the new normal in many of the places that we visit. Um, 
a so the three what I've trying to do in, so this is kind of a summary of the bulk of this paper, which is the active creation of, hack, uh, of hybrid wells. What I try to do is I, I, I look at three frontiers. Okay? And the three frontiers that you'll see here are number one, the frontier of the expanded as well as integrated ecosystem. Um, so it's an extended, expanded ecosystem of physical and virtual spaces. The second one is the growing phenomenon of reconfigured household, global households, and I'll explain all of those in a moment, and then Japanese storytelling traditions and their global hybrid forms. And I'm looking at three in particular, manga, kamishibai, and pichakucha. Um, why these three? They are kind of varied, and I explained that in, my, uh, in the paper. Uh, what I say is that the three frontiers are highlighted to illustrate the growing presence and reality of hybrid worlds, that's one thing. In terms of scope and in terms of scale, the examples are intentionally varied and dissimilar to shine light on the fact that hybridity is felt and experienced differently on the ground. And then the final section, what I will do is I will um, try to bring some relevance uh, discuss the relevance for missiology, uh, diaspora missiology, and call the church to active presence and participati participation in these frontiers. Okay, so that pretty much gives you an explanation of why I've included these very varied um, three frontiers. So the first one is the active, uh, the expanded integrated ecosystem of physical and virtual worlds. Now, in the opening paragraph of her essay, um, The Global Situation, and her essays in this particular book, uh, Anna Singh writes, click on world-making interconnections and your screen fills with global flows. And then she uses an, a very interesting metaphor, the metaphor of, um, it's actually more from geography and topography, right? Imagine a creek, a creek cutting through a, land, uh, a hillside, and as the water rushes down, it carves rock and moves gravel. It deposits silt on slow turns, it switches course and breaks dams after a sudden storm. As the creek uh, flows, it makes and remakes its channels. And then she talks about the internet system. Imagine an internet system linking up computer users or a rush of immigrants across national borders, or capital investment shuttled to, vary, uh, to varied offshore locations. The world-making flows, too, are not just interconnections, but also the recarvings of channels and the remapping of possibilities of geography. Now, having read Singh on this, you know, I have a little bit of a quarrel with her, because I find that her use of the reshaped topography, reshaped, reshaped geography, remains very inadequate. And let me just explain this in the paragraph that follows. Now, what she does is she uses the reshaped topography imagery, um, or her use of it, clearly makes the point that the worlds that we inhabit indeed have been subject to globalizing forces, and hence are dramatically remade. I have no quarrel with that. Uh, where the metaphor remains inadequate is in its failure to appreciate that virtual worlds are, uh, are new geographies. They are not remade geographies. Uh, they are new geographies that have been created ex nihilo. Uh, they are extensions uh, to present geographies, locales, and habitats. And they are not merely reshaping or recarvings or remappings of uh, prevailing geographies. So I propose that a more fitting imagery to describe virtual world making would come from architecture, from urban planning and place making. That the virtual world is better described as constructed networks of virtual places, pathways, publics, personalities and productions which extend which extend prevailing geographies. Life in the 12th, 12th century, the 21st century, is now lived in an expanded ecosystem of physical and virtual um, places. Now, again, let me just present it graphically so that it becomes a bit clearer for us. It's not just the one half, and it's not just an overlay on the one half. It's almost like two habitats now 
you know, it's an extension of the present uh, habitat. And so there's a world which through the screen, that's why they, you know, you've heard of the term screen ager, right? You know, screen ager. But um, teenagers that are glued to screens. Uh, but a new world is opened up to us uh, in, uh, in this, you know, when we think of it this way. Now, um, there's an American sociologist whose name is Ray Oldenburg, and he's, he's written uh, these two books, but his um, most popular one, uh, the one that really made the difference, uh, The Great Good Place that he wrote uh, several years ago. And in that book, he describes place, uh, the three essential places that people live. The place that we live, the place that we work, and the place that we gather to socialize at. The first place is um, where you live, second place is where you work, and the third place is where you socialize. The literature, interestingly, has already begun to describe digital or virtual third places, and by extension, second place. Now, I'm not sure whether philosophic, well, philosophically, I think it does exist, the digital first place. Nobody lives in a you know, in the digital world. I think parents think that their kids do, but I'm not sure whether it actually exists, okay? And the point is this, they are very porous, okay? The degree of poros porosity between one place and another is, is just amazing. So I can be, in fact, I did my PhD, I wrote all my PhD uh, sitting in a third place, uh, and in a physical third first place, third place, but actually doing my third and second place work. Because I was also socializing while I was writing my dissertation, right? So this is the reality that has become uh, today. Um, and so what this has resulted in is a situation where feet are firmly planted in physical space, while hearts and minds are deeply buried in virtual space. Within that expanded ecosystem of physical and virtual places, memories, imaginations, identities, habits, intuitions, social practices, self-worth, values, and aesthetic sensibilities are shaped in a culturally rich and diverse environment. It is at the intersection of the physical and the virtual that a complex, global, globally connected hybrid world has developed. If we leave our fingerprints at the places that we hang out, those, fingerprint, or those places equally leave their fingerprints on us. And it's under these conditions that we find the human race becoming more technological and technology become more, becoming more human. That's what I mean by hybridity. Uh, in the creation of this new hybrid world. Now, I'm not going to be reading some of the sections, I'm going to leave them out, but you know, in the paper I do uh, present some of the tensions between the flourishing and the floundering within these worlds. I give actual examples over there, but let me just move on. Uh, so, the, this hybrid world remains ubiqu ubiquitous and an integral part of everyday life for a very large proportion of the world's urban population. It is not a world that is easily navigated, controlled, or regulated. Nonetheless, the virtual and the digital has become, already become a prized, indispensable part of our world and our identity. Given how deeply the virtual and the digital has become rooted in daily life for the hybrid self, many will find the idea of unplugging rather disruptive and any suggestion of forced extrication quite unthinkable. Now, here we have a promise, we also have a problem, okay? Uh, I don't deal with that at this point of time. Okay, moving on. Uh, so the second active world that I want to be talking about, which is being created, is the growing phenomenon of reconvic reconfigured global households. I'm so glad, Miriam, for sharing. Thank you so much for sharing that facet of family. Uh, and I'm going to extend that uh, with this discussion here. Okay, so in page 59, you talk about, we talk about households as basics. So I'm introducing the whole idea of householding and global householding by extension. Households are basic to human reproduction, socialization, material provision, and psychological support. Among the fundamental roles of sustaining household include, and this is from Douglas, I'm quoting from Douglas, marriage partnering, bearing children, raising and educating children and adults, maintaining the household on, the, on a daily basis, 
dividing labor and pooling income uh, from livelihood activities and caring for elderly and other non-working household members. Um, how do I define global householding by extension? Uh, given the fact that the world is changing, given the fact that there's, um, people are able to move around from country to country, uh, we find that house, you see, the, the, the point is this, traditional households, the nature of traditional households is, is, really, is really changing. The roles that are being, that traditionally were played by certain people are not being played by them anymore. And in their places, we have surrogates from other parts of the world who are uh, plugging in those holes, as it were, okay? So global householding, uh, which is very much... Uh, kind of a, it's, it's a relatively new field in the social sciences uh, that is being picked up. But within there, global householding uh, literature is, is growing and it is viewed as the interactive process of forming and sustaining the household through global transactions. From a global household perspective, transnational population movement is only partially motivated and manifested in work and income opportunities. Marriage... Uh, Bearing, bearing, raising, and educating children and caring for the elderly are among the new motives and motivations for transnational movements and the linkages amongst people, and they are all integral to householding. Now, from a societal point of view, global householding is also a response to, and this is quoting um, Douglas, uh, is also a response to, a response to collapsing um, population growth below. Uh, replacement, so your um, low TFR, total fertility rate, um, your severe labor shortages, your rising dependency ratios, your welfare systems going broke, and your rapidly aging societies. Now, many of our countries that we come from um, suffer this. This is a big, major urban issue today. There are serious gaps in our households, and they are being plugged but by surrogates. So this whole idea of global householding is interesting because it suddenly introduces hybridity into our households. Um, sometimes the household role is taken up by a permanent foreign member, i.e. as in the bride, you know, a foreign bride, but sometimes they are taken up by very, very transient ones. So I have a couple of slides that I want to share. This, these are from Singapore. Uh, and so this is a matchmaking agency and I don't know if you can see the subtitle about Vietnamese wives. And a Vietnamese wife is keen to do household chores and is willing to take care of parents wholeheartedly. Okay? Keen and wholeheartedly. You know? uh, I take my students to visit this place and you know, they, either get, they, either get a, they either burst out laughing or they are truly incensed. Uh, by what they see. Okay, there's another one. Uh, select a bride on the spot or visit Hainan or Vietnam and choose from hundreds of beauties over there. You know, so marriage, of course, the male uh, or the bride idea is not common to Singapore uh, and typically it is a certain socioeconomic class that goes for this option. Um, but uh, the reality is that it is happening uh, even in Singapore. Is that all the time I have? Uh, and so, while parents are out there at work, surrogate um, parents take up the role. Uh, who looks after grandma and grandpa? You know, it's very often migrants who are on our shores that do that. Now, what is interesting in the literature on global householding is the flip side, which is global de-householding. And I want us to pay attention to this because at the same time, we find that something else is happening. While people are plugging up our gaps, they are also leaving gaps in their own household. So because of time, I'm just going to rush through all this. Um, it is a situation like that, where my gain, uh, you are plugging in my holes, uh, is your loss. Okay? And there is a new challenge, which I think many sending countries are beginning to feel that, and they need to address that issue. Okay, I'm going to move very quickly to the Japanese um, storytelling traditions and their global hybrid forms. Now, in the paper, what I do is I introduce this section by talking about the power of story and how many Japanese uh, storytelling vehicles have strong global appeal. 
Now, amongst them, I want to highlight three, which is manga. Number two is Kamishibai Street Theater, and then Pachakucha. Now, manga, a lot of people are familiar with manga, but you know, if you look at the history of manga, the simplified version that you see in the paper, I mean, it's obviously so much more complex. But you will find that you know, uh, manga itself has a very long tradition, but it was the Brits. It was, there was a foreign influence, the correspondents, the satirists, the, um, the cartoonists for the newspapers, you know, they were the ones that actually introduced the panel, the panels, you know, the comic panels and the speech bubble idea was all a, a, a Western idea. And then we find that many of the early Japanese manga uh, were actually written uh, to tell foreign stories. Um, and then what else I talk about is how manga then begins to get out of Japan into uh, different countries and, uh, and the conditions for its reception is also very different. So the Manga in America book is very interesting. It talks about the domestication of Japanese manga within the context of the publishing industry in America. So it was actually domesticated in America. That is very interesting. There's another book on global manga uh, by the same author. Uh, and you find that you know, it's, it's happening in different parts of the world. And the other thing I, I talk about is also the manga Bible idea. And so the Christian church has taken on that. I think one of the authors, uh, one of the manga drawers is, is a South Korean guy. Um, a, uh, at the end of this, I say that you know, there's a bit of a mixed reaction in terms of um, the Christian church also to, to this uh, phenomenon. The other second idea is the, the Kamishibai Street Theater. It is an, it's, it's really it's like PowerPoint, but you know, it's the earlier version of PowerPoint where you have a box and you have your cards inside and you just pull out your, your picture cards and you tell the story in the most lively, entertaining world. Okay? Um, in terms of its history, it was pretty much very popular in the uh, 20s to 50s. Uh, very much used amongst the urban poor. So the typical picture is a guy who's selling sweets and he's, an, he's, he's, he's um, riding his bicycle and he's got his kamishibai uh, stage at the back. Okay? It was used very much in wartime for propaganda. And then we find that it was recovered because of TV, it lost its appeal. Then we find that it was used again uh, as multimodal communication within education in schools, uh, largely Western schools. And uh, there were a couple of other uh, developments. Uh, Jackie Karin, who is an Australian uh, storyteller, uh, the uh, Australian Kamishabai Association, and then Jenna Khan from South Africa. Now, all I'm trying, what I'm trying to say is that you know, a, a, a traditional, very traditional Japanese form has been taken up and used in new contexts in new countries. Uh, so this is. Uh, I think her name is Anna Manuel uh, in Australia, uh, and uh, she's using it in this way. Now, Jackie K Karin did a very interesting uh, session, storytelling session several years ago, uh, last year in Singapore. And, she's, and I, attended, I attended the session, and she said something that really blew my mind. She said that they are use, she's using Kamishabai to tell the Hindu epic uh, Mahabharata, uh, to Australian teens who are very interested in that. I, my jaw dropped when I heard that, you know, because she's using a very Japanese thing to use, uh, to, to uh, speak to Australian teens about Hindu epic myths, okay? Now, this other character is very interesting. Uh, Jenna Khan, she spent time in, South, uh, in um, Japan, and she brought that form back. And she's a theatre artist, and, but she uses it in the pub and she uses it for all sorts of political and um, pub raunchy kind of stories. Uh, and I find that very interesting. Again, hybridization in uh, action. Um, yeah, so I'm going to skip this and then I'll just do my final and then I'll wrap up. Okay, so um, Pecha Kucha is a very interesting uh, way of telling a story using a particular format. Many of us are familiar with Twitter. Twitter has got a certain number of characters that you can use in order for you to message. In the same sort of way, Kamishiba, uh, sorry, um, Pechekucha, it was not actually started by Japanese, but it was started in Japan, in uh, Roppongi. Uh, and what it does is it takes 20 uh, slides 
and you're only given 20 seconds and then the slide moves on because it's automatically configured to move on and so you, you can only tell your story in, um, in that short time. Uh, one of the interesting things that I've observed about that, it was designed for, it was created for designers the fashionable, coolest people uh, on the block. So they typically have pachakucha um, evenings in all over the global, all over the globe, in the global cities, amongst a certain kind of people. If you look at the picture, you will find that it is normally uh, they have those meetings in the coolest places. It is done by the hippest people. It was the stories are told by, told by the hippest creatives to the most interesting hip hipster kind of audiences also. So, all I'm saying is that uh, a particular form that has been out there in the last maybe 10 years or so uh, is, is, there's, is a wildfire sort of thing. It's just going around amongst the creatives. What is the uh, relevance of what I've just shared uh, with us? You know, so I'm trying to pull it out together and maybe if you'll just give me another five minutes, let me just read my last section. It's not a long section, but maybe it will uh, help us to uh, pull it all together. Okay, so the evolving frontiers of hybridity and their relevance for diaspora missions. What are the threads that run through and hold the three evolving frontiers of hybridity described above? What relevance do they hold for diaspora missiology? While it is true that the work of missions focuses on people, it cannot be divorced from the world that they move and live in. The world's peoples on the move enter new worlds which they have to negotiate and navigate. As they move and mix, they spawn hybridization and they themselves are hybridized. At another level, the forces and effects of globalization are also introducing new frontiers of hybridization. These can be globally widespread and ubiquitous, as in the example of the expanded integrated ecosystem of physical and virtual spaces. They can also be globally located within specific pillars of society, as in the case of the growing phenomenon of reconfigured global households and reconfigured um, you know, households that have been de -households. Uh, otherwise, they can be globally situated within niche areas, as in the case of creatives deploying Japanese storytelling traditions to communicate in an age of visuality and visual culture. Whether they are felt at all levels or only at one sector of society, the three examples offer, uh, offered uh, represent fronts of innovation and rapid change. These are but a few of the evolving culturally mixed worlds that the people, the world's peoples will inhabit and where perspectives, intuitions and social practices are being reordered. When we consider activity at these fronts, what is disconcerting is that the church remains slow to adapt or respond there. The church has little influence at frontiers of change and innovation. At times it remains unaware and ignorant, at other times it remains resistant and reactionary. Otherwise it remains silent and absent. Yet it is a matter of missional imperative and pastoral responsibility that the, serve, that the church serves to, through, beyond and with the people on the move at new hybridizing frontiers and worlds. These frontiers are expanding and redefining the context within which diaspora missiology needs to be situated. In response, the call is for bearers of the gospel of Jesus Christ to engage, to mobilize, to be active, to be present, and I would add to be prophetic at these missional friends. Thank you.